Although we were, some Gedalia passed already. What would happen if a person were to say, I can't fast two times in one week? You know, the day after Rosh Hashanah was a fast day, fast day of Gedalia. And the week later, you have to fast on Yom Kippur, right? Thursday, Thursday. If I fast on some Gedalia, I can do it. But if I do, I will not be able to fast on Yom Kippur. Do we allow the person to eat on some Gedalia? He's healthy. He or she can do it. No issue. I just can't do it twice in one week. It's an interesting question. It's a highly uh, sophisticated question in halakha. And I believe the answer to that question is no. We worry, in other words, you don't give the person the right not to fast on some Gedalia. Right now you have an obligation to fast. Take care of it right now. What will happen later, it's not your business right now. Later is later. So we take care of the now rather than thinking about the future, even though the future fast is much more severe, much more important than Kippur. It's from the Torah. And some Gedalia is only from the Nevi'im, it's not from the Torah. It's a fast that came later. Yet, whatever comes to your hand, even, even if it's not biblical, it's only rabbinical, Madrabanan, that takes precedent. Question number two, another question someone asked me, not here. What happens, not what happens, but what is the reason why we don't make a bracha? On Arab Yom Kippur, we mentioned yesterday, it's a mitzvah to eat. Don't we make brachas before every mitzvah? So why don't we make a bracha, after Kiddushana, the mitzvah of Sivano, to eat on Arab Yom Kippur? And really, the answer to that question is the answer to a lot of other questions. Same question you could ask on Shabbos. The mitzvah to eat on Shabbos, we don't make a bracha. The answer, the answer is quite easy. Huh? Sorry? <laughs> what did I say? You said, what did I said, what did we answer? After I didn't answer yet. I didn't answer. I asked the question why don't we make a bracha before we do the mitzvah of eating on Arab and Kippur? It's a mitzvah. Before you do a mitzvah, you're supposed to make a bracha, right? So why don't we make a bracha on this mitzvah? So the answer to the question is, you speak French? What language? I don't know why I put it sometimes. Okay. Um, speak slow. The answer is that we don't make brachas on a mitzvah if what you're doing is not obvious if you're doing it for a mitzvah sake. Now, for example, matzah, who would eat matzah on Pesach? Who would bench Lula? Who would eat in a sukkah if not for God commanded you? Strange thing to do. Or sit in a sukkah, you know. People are coming into their houses, getting cooler. Why would you sit in a sukkah? Sit home. Why would you eat matzah? Eat challah. That you make a bracha. But what am I eating on every kipper? The same food I would eat any other day. There's no special mitzvah to eat. Yeah, we have a minute you eat krepla. You know krepla ha? It's the dough, pocket dough that has meat inside. It has significance, al picavola. The dough is white, lighter color, it's chesed. The meat is red, it's kivura. We want all the uh, negative things to be covered with the chesed of the krepwa, the, the dough. Okay. That's a min. There's no obligation to eat it. You're not violating anything you don't eat it. Some people don't like meat. You don't have to eat it. Um, this generation, I call a milchika generation. Right? Yes. Nobody likes to eat flesh. Who eats, who eats chong? Oh, please, Rabbi, not for me. It's a, a, I call this a, a dairy generation, milk of the generation. Um, so that's the reason why we don't make a bracha on eating Arab Yom Kippur or Shabbos. What do you eat on Shabbos? What do you eat on the rest of the week? Basically, you can't really tell I'm eating it because it's a mitzvah because it's Shabbos. It happens to be a mitzvah, but what I'm eating is the same diet as I, as I would eat the rest of the week. And likewise, Eric and Kipper. So then someone asked, okay, well, how about making a bracha? It's a mitzvah to fast, to afflict ourselves, to afflict. means to afflict, not to answer. And the answer is you don't make a bracha on something negative, on an absence of an act. You don't make a bracha on, we don't eat. It has to be something you do, whether it's eating, whether it's sitting in the sukkah, whether it's benching lulav, hearing the shofar, 
but it has to be an act before you make a bracha, not a non-act, passive. It's a mitzvah not to eat. Can't do that. Okay. We mentioned yesterday that women are also obligated in the midst of eating every kipper, even though you might want to ask, we have a rule, any time binding mitzvah women are usually exempt from, which is time binding. Arabian kipper is only Arabian kipper, right? You can't eat Arabian kipper on a different day. It's time binding. But because, <coughs> because the fast day is obligation, since women are to fast on Yom Kippur, and eating helps the fast. So if they're obligated to fast, they're obligated, obviously, to eat as well. Some say that, and I'll, the Alta Rebbe actually says this, to eat twice as much as you would normally eat. Be another reason why we have two rules. If you can, you don't, if you can't, you can't. But I'm saying if you're going to you know, stuff yourself up. But if a person is able to try to eat twice as much and make it as many brachot as possible that day. Um, Okay, let me ask you another question. I'm going to try to cover as much ground as possible. Um, what do we not say in the davening on Yom Kippur, Arab Yom Kippur, and Wednesday morning? We're going to omit a paragraph from the davening shacharis. Does anyone know what paragraph it is? Ma medalgim b'tfilat shacharit lo amrim b'tfilat shacharit yom rvi'i b'avokeh. Rachel, very good. Wow, what's that called? Mizmar, very good. Why do we not say that paragraph on Wednesday morning? Anyone know that? What's the reason? We also don't say it on Erev Pesach. Why do we not say this on Erev Yom Kippur? And the answer is, what is this all about? It's about a thank you offering. If a person was almost in a fatal accident, Miraculously, you survived. You recovered from COVID and you were really, really sick. You were intubated or you were really, really not doing well. And then you come back and you're okay. You gotta make Hagomel today. We make a special bracha by the Sefer Torah. And in the days when we had the Beis Amikdash, one second, we, you could bring a korban or for a sacrifice called korban toda. Korban lohodot lohashem al ha-yeshua v'hasala. Okay, that's that. So we make a special, a special carbon. That carbon has a deadline of how long you have. It's accompanied with a lot of food, also a lot of um, breads, uh, matzah and chametz breads, so all a whole long, you know, a lot going on. But there's an animal that's offered. That animal has to be eaten within one day and one night. Anything that's left over, you violate a commandment by leaving any food left over. Now, Arab Yom Kippur, in the morning, you have to finish everything before your new kipper starts. And we're worried that you're not going to be able to do that, and thus it'll be left over. Because if it goes, if it's left over and not eaten, you violate past the time. So we therefore never offered in the base of Mikdos, never offered the carbon on Arab new kipper. And since what we say that paragraph is to commemorate that carbon, we therefore omit that paragraph on um, any time we cannot eat out the deadline. For example, tonight is Pesach, and eat chametz on Pesach, and part of the food they ate was chametz. Or if you can't eat at all, because Yom Kippur, that carb on that sacrifice was not offered that morning, and therefore we omit it. Okay, um, we don't we don't say tachanun, no avinu alkenu. Davening is pretty short. Yom Kippur in the morning, the fast shabbos. Men wear kittel, a kittel. Not a kittel, a kittel, which is a white overgarment. Before the under kapata, they wear a white, looks like shrouds. And it reminds us of our future to humble us. It's one of the reasons we should do chuba, because it reminds us of what we, we are buried with shrouds. That's scary, but it also has angelic look to it. Angels have a connection to the color white. White is a symbol of purity. You know the story with the scapegoat, they offered in the Beis Amikdash, the scapegoat, there was a, a strip of wool, a, a tongue-shaped a, a tongue strip of wool that was tied to the head of the scapegoat. They dyed it red. 
In the times of the great sage, Shimon HaTzadik, he was from the remnant of the men of great assembly. He lived a few hundred years before the destruction of the second base of Uh It's like before Hanukkah even, even before the Hanukkah miracle. A few hundred years before the destruction of Bayashani. And in his days, the miracle happened, the scarlet red ribbon turned into white. And it was a fulfillment of a pasuk. This was a good sign, a sign like Hashem is forgiving the Jews for their sins, because red is symbolic of sin. White, lavan, the yanshel kapara akola kapaim, means Hashem is forgiving us. We're cleared. White is clear. So this, the Apostle King Yeshaya says the following if your sins will be like crimson, red, like crimson threads, they will become white like snow as an indication of you will be purified. Yom Kippur will purify you. And if that crimson red tongue-shaped tongue, tongue -shaped, uh, wool turned white miraculously, it was a great sign. In the times of Rabbi Shemin it did it happened, the miracle happened. Later on, it didn't, and it was not a good sign. So we see that red is a sign of sin, and white is symbolic of purity. That's another reason why men wear kitlap. Women, some women also dress in white. Uh, I don't know if that's customary everywhere. It has to be that way, but many women dress in white on Yom Kippur. You know, the Aaron Kodesh has a white parochas instead of the red or whatever color the rest of the year, it's a white parochas. Okay, now, I forgot to mention yesterday, I'll mention it today. What do we have to do before Yom Kippur? It's a man to man, a woman to woman thing, person to person thing. Ask forgiveness. And how many times do you have to ask before the person forgives you? Three times. Should the person, does the person have an obligation to forgive you? Yes. When will a person not have an obligation to forgive you? Is there any, any time when the person will not be obligated to do so? So there's two cases. If you besmirch this person, ruin that person's reputation, you ruin the person's name. It's not just you insulted him or her, but that person is suffering from that. Then you're not obligated to, to be mochel. But if you're a chassid or a chassidah, you should nonetheless be mochel also. Unless if by being mochel, by forgiving that person, it will do harm to you. If you're forgiving that person will cause harm, then there's no mitzvah at all to forgive that person. If you see the person is not sincere and he will take advantage of your forgiving, you forgive, ha ha ha, now I can go to the win. Then you have to also, not only is it not obligatory, it's better for you not to forgive that person, but you have to know for sure that that person is going to become, you know, uh, spoiled or, or is going to take advantage of your forgiveness. A teacher is not obligated to forgive a student, but should do it anyways. But the obligation of a teacher to a student is not the same as you know, colleagues or friends one to another. Um, but it's important to ask Mechila, very important to ask Mechila before you give her. What happens if you were eating, you're eating your meal the second meal, the free fast meal, and um, you made a verbal declaration, I am hereby accepting upon myself the fast. If you said that, yes. What? The other one was if the person is not sincere and forgiving, not forgiving him will do him a favor. You'll, you'll be able to affect him much more by not forgiving him or her right away. You have to be sure about that. You can't just say, ah, you know, some people like, like to use that as an excuse. Um, okay, now going back to, if let's say you accept upon yourself the fast before the fast had to be accepted, Accept upon the fast before sunset. But let's say you did it a half an hour earlier and you really had in mind to accept the fast. 
You're forbidden to eat and do everything. You can't wash your hands anymore. One thing you're still allowed to do is wearing your shoes because you were wearing your shoes when you accepted the fast. Obviously, you didn't include that. If you were still wearing your shoes when you declared verbally, I want to accept the fast, you did not include in that declaration wearing shoes. So that was supposed to be allowed. Unless you say, unless you have no shoes on when you're, when you're saying that, then it's a different story. But if you have your shoes on, the declaration of I hereby accept my fast, the fast will not include wearing shoes. Um, this, by the way, after the fast is over, washing one's hands, all the other things that we can't do throughout your kipper besides eating, you could do even before Havdalah. If you want to wash your hands, you should wash your hands before Havdalah anyway. We, do, we wash our hands, you know, when it feels you're dying. But smearing all the other things that we're told not to do, wearing shoes, is no problem as long as it's dark, even though you have not made Havdalah. Havdalah is only to be able to eat. You can't eat until you make Havdalah, unless you're extremely not feeling well. That's a different story. And of course, you don't have to wait. But if you feel you could wait, you have to wait for Havdalah and not eat before. But the other things that we don't, that we refrain from, what are the other things, by the way? There are five, right? What are the five things? So eating and drinking is one. Number two, washing, as we said before, bathing. That would include any kind, even, even getting your finger wet. If you're doing it just for the purpose of feeling good, if you have some dirt on your finger, you know, that's no problem. Then you're allowed to wash. If you're removing dirt, it's no problem. You're not doing it for pleasure's sake, you're doing it to remove dirt. So then it's not an issue. But whatever kind of dirt it is, that's the second thing you can't do. What's the third thing you can't do? Well, sicha, using uh, uh, ointments, things to smear on your body, lotion should not be smeared, even if you're doing it to remove something, unless it's medical. If there's no medical need for it, you don't do it. So that's a little more, a little more strict than the, than the washing. So that's three. Fourth thing is the shoes. You walk without leather, and even the leather's on the top of your shoe, and the soles are not leather. Even if there's any leather on the shoe, you refrain from wearing it also. You have no other choice, it's a different story, but if you're able to wear sneakers or whatever it is, slippers, it's that's the choice you should use. Not not anything that has any leather on it. The fifth thing is marital relations, and that's related to people who are married. So there are five inuyim, five levels of affliction on this on this holiday. What other five do we have in the kipper? Five things you have to abstain from, and what other five do we have? Uh -huh. And well, yeah, but what what about your kipper? Where do you see five in Yom Kippur? Five tefillahs, right? We dive in five times. Mayrib, Shacharit, Musa, Minko, and the Ida. They correspond to the five levels of the soul, yes. Children at the age of 11, if they're able to, if they're strong, start fasting, boys and girls. If today, however, this was true in the olden days when we were stronger. The body, our bodies are weaker than they used to be, by the way. It's like the minds are weaker, the bodies are also weaker, uh, inconsistent. And we have uh, the weak, the weaknesses, weakness has descended into the world. And we don't force any child below bar mitzvah to fast a whole day, uh, unless that kid is proven to be really strong and unusually strong. However, at the age of nine, I believe, we get them used to fasting an extra hour. Or two hours. So they would normally eat breakfast at eight o'clock, they wait till nine. Nine, wait till ten. That we do today. But to fast a whole day, although it says when the age of 11 is to start doing it, we don't. Many start fasting um, three fast days before their bar bas mitzvah. So the Kippur might be one of them. But at the age of 11, it's too early today. In today's generation, we find that too difficult for people, for kids to fast. So unless the kid really is strong, we don't make him fast. You're allowed to give your child to eat. You should give them to eat, but not bathing. No, no head to bathe your child on your kipper, and no head to have him or her wear shoes. Even though it's a little child, not going to suffer by wearing sneakers. Some kids like wearing sneakers. 
So if a five-year-old kid wants to put on shoes, you're not allowed to let him put on shoes or her put on shoes. Um, throughout the day, we mentioned three types of slicha, mechila, kapara. And we also mentioned khatasi, avisi, pashati. I sinned, I sinned, I sinned. Well, there are different kinds of sins. Khatasi means I sinned inadvertently, bishogeg. I didn't mean it by mistake. I forgot that today is Shabbos. Or today is Yom Kippur. Uh, whatever sin it was. Obviously, I did it knowingly because I couldn't hold myself back. It was too tempting. I ate something I wasn't supposed to eat. It was too tempting. That's called a deliberate sin. The third level is I didn't have any temptation to eat this. Why did I eat it? Because God said not to eat it. That's why I'm eating it. I'm angry at God. That's called Pesha. So Chatat means I didn't mean it. Avon means I did mean it, but I had temptation. I didn't mean to hurt God. I just wanted to satisfy my own needs. And Pesha means deliberate. There's three types of forgiveness. Slicha, Mechila, Kapara. Anyone know the difference? Slicha, Mechila, Kapara. The Slicha means God pardons you. I don't like you. I'm not going to punish you. I'll pardon you. You know, you're a criminal. Criminals get pardoned also. They don't mean, it doesn't mean that they're okay. It means that we won't uh, let you suffer anymore. Or Hashem will not punish us. Mechila means that Hashem will remove. Uh, in other words, he will not only forgive you in terms of not punishing you, but he will also forgive you. It's as if you didn't do anything. Kapara means that we wash away any remnant of what you did. In other words, the relationship was affected by your sin. The kapara means complete wash up, wash away, wipe away of any remnant of sin. In other words, it's as if you didn't do it. Not that I'm forgiving you, but it's clear. It doesn't exist anymore. It never, it's as if it never happened. So the three different stages of how Hashem forgives. First, he pardons. We ask Hashem, please pardon us. And then if he accepts that, can you please be mochel us, forgive us? Not just pardon us from sin, from punishment, but really forgive us and accept that what we did, we didn't mean it. That's forgiveness. You know, you didn't really mean it. If you only would have known how, what, you, what you've done, how bad it is, you never would have done it. So you know what? I forgive you. You're not really a bad person. The part is, you didn't do anything wrong. You did nothing wrong. Nothing wrong. Or even better, as we'll learn in the Sikha, that what you did can be transformed into a mitzvah. Because sometimes when a person sins, you feel so bad about it, you have such a strong thrust of getting closer to Hashem, if you felt you betrayed Him, and you want to make up, and you want to go beyond what you, norm what you would normally do before you sin. So actually the sin triggers the sin uh, it's like an ener energetic force that makes you a better person, a better chassid to Hashem. And therefore, it's as if the sins themselves become mitzvahs. That's the power of kapara. So it's way beyond slicha mechila. So first we ask Hashem slicha, then we ask Hashem for mechila, then we ask Hashem for kapara. And the al one of the al is al that we sin with you with our Yetzirah. Does that make sense? Isn't every sin with the Yetzirah? So why do we pick out one sin? The chayt is one sin that I did because I have a Yetzirah. I sinned with my Yetzirah. So the Rebbe always give the answer that sometimes your Yetzirah is not in the mood to make you sin. Yetzirah is tired. But you provoke your Yetzirah. You wake him up. You're not in the mood. You're tired. And therefore your body is not in the mood to do something wrong. But you get yourself in the mood. So you actually provoked and woke up your Yitzhahara. That's a special al okay, just for that. Okay. Um, I want to go back to the um, laws of the Kriya Torah. How many people get called up? How many men get called up to the laning on Yom Kippur? On Yom Kippur, it's five. On Shabbat, it's seven. On Yom Kippur, it's in between, which is six. Six people get called up. 
The holier the day, the more people get called up. So Shabbos is the holiest of all, seven. Kippur is six, and Yantav is five. Um, Abdullah, at the end of the day, before we have an Abdullah, we actually have here a chauffeur. Why is the chauffeur blowing in your kipper? What's the purpose? Does not say anywhere to blow a chauffeur on your kipper. Yes, they used to, used to blow chauffeur every 50 years on the Yobel Jubilee year. But why do we blow chauffeur every Yom Kippur at the end of the day? So there are two reasons given by the Alter Rebbe. One reason is it's a sign of a departure of the Shekhinah. When the Torah was given, at Hashem finished, and, he's, and the Shekhinah departed, right before the departure, there's a chauffeur blowing, indicating the Shekhinah is now taking leave. So Yom Kippur, likewise, at the end of the day, this Holiness of a day, the Shina departs. One reason. Another interesting reason is it's a, to make an announcement that it's a mitzvah to eat on the night after Yom Kippur, meaning to consider it a yontif, to say good yontif to each other. Not everyone knows that after Yom Kippur, it's actually a yontif. What's the yontif? We're celebrating our atonement, our removal of all sins. That's something to celebrate. But because we celebrate, and it's not well known, we're told to celebrate by making an announcement through a shofar blowing. As I mentioned, a tekiya, a plain sound is a sign of simcha. When you break it, da, 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 that's a sign of brokenhearted. But a tekiya is a sign of joy. So a joyous sound of the shofar is a symbol, it's yontif tonight. What's different about the Habel, about the Habela candle on Yom Kippur over Shabbos? Special rule about the Habella candle. There's no psalmim, if it's not on Shabbos, but we do have the bracha, bore, more, ha'esh. Customary that women do not make this bracha, but it's interesting to know that this bracha that, that we make on the Habella candle is different than the Shabbos candle. What's the difference? The Shabbos candle, you can rub two sticks together, matches, and you get two matches together, you can use that. You know why? Because it commemorates Adam. Adam Adam Arishoy, his first Shabbos, there was no darkness. He had he was created on Friday after Friday morning. The whole Friday it was light. Friday night it, it was not, the sun didn't go down. And the entire Shabbos, 36 hours of straight light. Then it got dark after Shabbos. And he looked for stones or two or pieces of wood, made his own match, and created a fire. So to commemorate that, we also have the fire. Way other, and man is like compared to fire. It says the soul of man, ner Hashem nishmas Adam. The soul of man is compared to a fire, since Adam was the first man who made this fire after Shabbos. So therefore, to commemorate that, we also have a candle uh, on Maaseh Shabbos. But the Kippur, we can't do that. The fire that we use has to be a fire that was there a whole Shabbos and not used. It rested a whole Shabbos, like a, a yard site lid, or any light that was there wasn't used. But it wasn't ignited on Shabbat, on Yom Kippur. It had to be ignited before Yom Kippur and arrested the entire Yom Kippur. That's the fire you got to use for the Abdullah candle. No other fire. So you can't just open your gas range because that gas range wasn't open, it was not on a whole, a whole Yom Kippur. If it was, you could, but it wasn't on a whole Yom Kippur. You can't use that. Turn on the gas range. I have it on a fire, and now I can you make you can't make a bell with that fire. It has to be a candle that was lit and was not touched the entire Yom Kippur. To teach us that Yom Kippur was holy, we weren't allowed to use any fire. Yom Kippur is not like Yom Kippur, where you can't uh, Yom Kippur you can cook. Yom Kippur you can't cook, even for kids. It's like Shabbos in that sense. You can't carry unless there's an Eru, and there's no Eru here for lights. But no, yeah, there are people who use this air room, so-called air room, and they're not allowed to. And the reason for that is because I'm not going to go into the details of halakha, but there are Rabbanim in, in the basin of Crown Heights. When they issue a ruling, everyone who lives here is forced to abide. You cannot say, I don't subscribe. You can say it all you want, but it means nothing. When you're living in a city where there's a basin, and there is a basin here in Crown Heights, the rabbis who disagree on many things agree that air room is not kosher for Brooklyn. Rabbi Moshe, Moshe Feinstein, one of the greatest post of the previous generation, 
uh, claim that Brooklyn is a Rashus Harabim. It's a uh, public domain. You cannot make an aid of any public domain. Uh, I'm not going to get into all the lumpus and all the uh, scholarly discussion about this. It's very, very deep and very intricate. But there's no aid of here in Crown Heights. You see people carrying, you know, they're not that 100% religious. You can see not only because they're carrying, you can see that they're not careful in mod laws of modesty and, and other things that they do. And I've seen them carrying umbrellas on Yom Kippur and on Shabbos. An umbrella for sure is forbidden, even in your home. You're not allowed to open an umbrella on it. You can't wear it, you can't open an umbrella on Shabbos or Yom Tif. So even on Yom Tif, you can, you know, on Yom Tif you can carry, you can't carry an umbrella. They carry umbrellas and they do other things. Uh, I saw two girls, I was, very, I was very bothered by this, two girls, I mean, it seemed like they were, you know, but they were Crown Heights girls. Friday night, it's Friday night. I'm Crown, I'm Carol Street. I'm walking home from school Friday night. They're carrying, okay, because they believe in the area. That doesn't prove that they're not. And then there's an apartment building and one girl goes to the wall and presses something and the buzzer opens up. Um, in other words, this April business is giving people a, a belief that everything goes on Shabbos. I'm not saying that they would not do that otherwise, but it, it, it's causing a tremendous uproar of, well, three cast all of not caring about Shabbos and making Shabbos into a weekday. I saw kids riding on bicycles on Shabbos. That's for sure forbidden, even with an April. Um, taking their tennis rackets and going to the park playing tennis or baseball with their kids wearing shorts. That's very Shabbos thing, right? So you see that this Eidol is creating a lot of negativity, uh, lacking the Shabbos has become a weekend. I don't know if I'm supposed to be saying this to you, but I'm saying it anyway, because it really bothers me when I see this. Uh, anyone who's living in Crown Heights, if you're living elsewhere and you believe that you want to follow a different rabbi, you can maybe, but in Crown Heights, you have to follow the sack of the rabbis here, and I happen to know first time from my father that the Rebbe was also very much against having an Edelman Crown Heights. It never existed. There was a rank of bringing every single Shabbos. Having what? What? Okay. Eruv, Eruv. 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 No, no, I don't say You know what Eruv is, yeah? Yeah. So in Eretz Israel, you can. I remember seeing a girl, from girl, reading a Dwar Mahalthus. She's reading the Rebbe Sicha, walking the street on Shabbos. And I told her, it's not, it's, there's no Eruv here. Oh, 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 she got so, I don't know what to do. Whoa. From girl, really, you know, a Sicha girl. And uh, they don't know. People don't know. And another problem with having Eruv is that kids grow up without even knowing that there's a prohibition against carrying. Because they're so used to always carrying on Shabbos, they carry anywhere. It's, it's inevitable that they're going to carry in a place where there's no Eruv. So for that, all these reasons, it's highly questionable whether the Rebbe was for aid of even another city. But for sure in Crown Heights, 100% clear, no, a big no, no. The Rebbe was extremely, in fact, I heard once that the Rebbe, before he became Rebbe, phoned Rabbi Moshe Feinstein, who was the post of his generation, to please come out with a response of a tshuva that it's forbidden to have an Eruv in Brooklyn. And he did so. His opinion was, and the Rebbe was the one who Got him to do it. Um, okay, now. What time is it? Um, any questions of anything we did? We not discuss? Yes. Yeah. No, I air around your around and on your. That's okay. That's a different story. I'm talking about air around the city. That's the problem. And also, it's very, very likely that the Eru becomes invalid so easily in the wind. It happens almost every, and no one knows about it. So in, in cities, in the olden days, when they had Eru, it was, was like a ghetto city where everyone knew everything. And they were careful, they were from, they were very religious. Today, people, you see the people who carry, people who are dressed inappropriately, uh, people who, you know, go playing tennis on Shabbos because there's an Eru. So it's a different kind. They don't really care if the Eruv goes down. There's an Eruv. They're going to really bother. They're going to, how's the Eruv doing? They don't care. So in these, you can't compare the olden days to today. And the Rebbe has foresight, knew what it's going to look like in 2021. So 
the Rebbe was very strongly against. My father spoke with the Rebbe before he became Rebbe about this issue also. So if anyone tells you otherwise, come to me. I'll tell you it's not true. My father had a one-on-one -on -one discussion over the phone with the Rebbe. He spoke with the Rebbe in learning before the Rebbe became Rebbe for hours. And he was crazy. And my father said the Rebbe was like, every time the Rebbe spoke, he said something. He quoted a Gemara and he said, I think maybe it's over here. And you know, it was right over there. He never said, I know for sure. I think maybe in such a humble way, and whatever question I had, my father was no, uh, you know, <laughs> was a great, brilliant man himself. And he said it, it was like uh, unbelievable, the, you know, his humility and the incredible knowledge of uh, memory was like impeccable. And you could see he's hiding a lot more than he's revealing. I remember the Rebbe, <laughs> my first encounter with the Rebbe when I was four years old. I do remember this when I was on the floor. My father you know, was standing up to the Rebbe. I broke out of my father's hands and hugged the Rebbe's legs. No. Uh, <laughs> and then I remember I yanked. <clears throat> my father yanked me, gave me a push. And boy, I still feel that pain. I'm a little more than four right now. And I, I feel it because <laughs> So that thing like that to me, I think. But I do remember clearly, I'll tell you another story. This I remember clearly. Rebbe used to walk out of 770, such a beautiful sight after the morning on a sun on a summer afternoon. Morning went from 1:30 to around six. It's still light outside. Rebbe would come out. Everyone is standing there singing like a, a king, almost like a melody, with love. And that was a smile, broad smile to everyone. There was a little kid standing right next to me. I kid you not. He took the Rebbe's hands and went like this. Hi, Rebbe. And the Rebbe let his hand for about 15 seconds, let his hand be played with like that. Finally, the kid let, let go. The Rebbe went like that with a smile. The grandfather was standing there, was beside himself. He writes a letter to the Rebbe after Shabbos. Rebbe, I want to apologize for my grandson did to you. The Rebbe writes back, apology? Question mark, exclamation mark. On the contrary, he gave me a tremendous amount of nachas. Halavai, I only wish the adults would do the same. Not the same, I think. I mean, the adults will also give me nachas, like the child gave me. So this is just uh, interesting. I also had eight times, one-on-one -on -one with the Rebbe on my birthday. Both would go into their girl store, I think also, would go into the Rebbe, one-on-one, -on -one, and boy, was that an experience. And if you think the Elon and Kipper, this is more powerful than any any anything any day anywhere because you look you're walking into a room where there's someone who can see right through you knows everything you did is the Moshe Rabbeinu of this generation the Nasi Akloli Nasi Hadar and who knows what else and gives a penetrating look that goes right through your your, your so, so you want to make sure before you go in to wipe away any kind of you know if I did something wrong it says if you do tshuva. So even a Rebbe can't see that on your forehead. But if you mess up your life, it looks like your forehead fell right away. So you, you like to hide. It's a tremendous feeling of, of humility. It's, it's unbelievable. It's a feeling that you can't, I can't put into words. Uh, I had one-on-one, -on -one. A little, little me, little, uh, this little nobody, with the Rebbe himself. And there was such a, you felt such a, a love. My brother just revealed something he never revealed before, my older brother. Uh, was told to, he has now a weekly thing uh, that he gives his Torah and speaks about personal experiences. So just to end with this last thing, he says, um, I'll tell you an experience I had, and he starts crying in the middle. I, I'm from Buffalo, and I brought Buffalonians to the Rebbe Fabrangan. And I'm translating to these Buffalonians simultaneously while the Rebbe's talking. So I'm looking at the Rebbe. All of a sudden, I see the Rebbe gives me a look of a smile that I've never seen before in my life. A smile to me saying, thank you. Wow. It's exactly what I want you to do. Wow. And a feeling of such a love. Wow. When he said that, he started crying. So the Rebbe is, wow, his, his incredible feeling of gratitude. That's what you're here for, not just to be yourself. You're here to share with others who don't know Yiddish. My brother is a brilliant, brilliant you know, young man himself. And he was able to focus on the Rebbe and on them. The Rebbe was like smiling up. You see, he was like enjoying the sight. To make the Rebbe happy like that is the greatest feeling in the world. You see him 
Um, then the Rebbe, um, the Rebbe Kippur, the high Rebbe Kippur, the Rebbe would get up after fasting a whole day. And uh, the Rebbe gave out lekach the whole day before, probably ate nothing even there, Rebbe Kippur, almost ate nothing, had no time to eat. And um, oh, we eat honey cake, by the way. And yeah, many people go to get from a tzaddik or anyone who's not, if you don't have a tzaddik, you go to anyone to give you cake, a piece of honey cake, that if I ever have any needs, Throughout the year, I shouldn't have any, anyone, I should not need to come on to human help. And this is the only time I'm going to need a human being to give me anything. You need to ask for it? Yes, yes. The Rebbe gives honey cake to everyone. We do the same thing on Hashanah Rabba after the last day of Sukkot before Shemini, before the Shemini Terrace in Kassara. Mention this. Do you know what the Rebbe said Seder was? The Rebbe did not sleep the whole Sukkot. I boom, but never did not go to bed the entire seven days. Now, if you're 80 years old and you're standing on your feet and having gone to sleep for seven days and you're giving out lekka, try to go like this for five hours and you haven't eaten yet and you haven't slept in a week. Can you imagine doing that if you're 20? The devil would have, would not be able to move his hand and he had to eat. By the way, Ervin Kippur, the devil would always, the whole year round, only eat with one hand, never have a second hand on the table, only one hand. Got it from his father. On Eric Kipper, he'd eat with two hands. He would have two hands over the table. The whole thing, it's not for all of us. Why? I don't know. His father did that, Pikabala. The whole year round, only use one hand over the table. On Eric Kipper, two hands. Yes, I don't know the reason. A lot of things I don't know. One of the many things I don't know. So what was I saying? Um, what was I saying? Uh, so, and there's no time for him to eat that day. He has to go straight to Hakopas. What, you know what Hakopas are? On some Ashwinia Terrace? Remember standing there, making like that with his hands, like that, like that, like a windmill. And thousands of people are jumping up and down. The women uh, on the Bible show, the men downstairs. And the Rebbe didn't go to sleep that night. Why? Because Asuk is. It's still sukkah. It's me on terrace. We still sit in the sukkah. And there's a whole the debate about whether you sleep in the sukkah. So the Rebbe doesn't go to sleep. Solve the problem. I don't go to sleep. <laughs> That's all. Then the next night, we think, okay, so it's not sukkah, it's not sukkah anymore. Now you go to sleep. But the, the Rebbe had a harangue in three hours, and then five hours, like four hours, like couples. It's morning already. The Rebbe never sleeps in the morning. And past dawn, the Rebbe never goes never sleeping. At dawn, he's either, he's always awake. He never sleeps during the day. The Rebbe never slept on Friday night. Any, a whole year around. No sleeping Friday night. One of the conditions to the marriage of the previous Rebbe's order. So much I can tell you right now. Now, let's imagine the next night is finally Simchas Torah is over. But there's a Fabrengen leading into the last day. Starting at 6, Skia going till four in the morning, followed by giving out coach of wine from his becker. It's already the next morning. Eleven days have gone by. The next night, Yichidut. People going up to a whole night with their problems. Twelve days that ever hasn't gone to sleep. That's normal. That's what I witness. We witness an open miracle, a person who's not of this world. Human being with all the feelings of a human being, but not of this world. There's so much I can tell you to share with you. There's so much I can do, but it's limited time. Um, you know the famous story? They wanted to give the Rebbe an opener, an envelope opener, so it'll be much faster. Make a long story short, the Rebbe gave all kinds of excuses. So finally, someone, because they made too much noise, so they found one, a silent one. It took a, how they found it, don't ask. And the Rebbe said, I, I can't use it. Why? When people write to me, they write with tears. I have to feel the tears in my fingers. The machine can't catch the tears. So I have to feel the letter. I feel the letter with my, I can feel the person's heart, soul, tears when I touch the letter. You can have enough to bring us another time, but I, I go on and on and on of personal experiences that it's, it's beyond amazing. It's not normal. We take for granted. You know, I say they go every Shabbos to so bring in. My son says, my son never witnessed a bring he's too young. He says, you really, you, you mamish went to, 
In Brooklyn, we saw someone the equivalent of Moshe Rabbeinu in Brooklyn. I mean, you're so lucky. Why did I have all that? Why did I have all that? Every Shabbos, the Rambam is for bringing, Rashi is for bringing in 770, Rabbi Akiva is there. Avram Bovino is in 770. The Baal Shem Tov is in 770. The Ariza, I mean, just imagine here, what a schuss you had. I mean, how did you, how did you, how did you, how did you live? I said we were spoiled. We got used to it. Anyway, have a wonderful Yontif. I'm a keeper. And Mark Sima to all of you. And it's a pleasure. I don't know what's is there a Friday or is there a Friday class? I don't know. You know? You don't think so?